Welcome to The Impact Effect, hosted by conscious leadership expert Tom Eddington, advisor to some of the world's most successful companies and CEOs, where each week we help executives, entrepreneurs, and organizers become more effective leaders while growing businesses that are making an impact in the world. And now, here's Tom. Hi, welcome to the Impact Effect Network, a place where we discuss making business matter through conscious leadership. I'm Tom Eddington. My guest today is Dr. Gary Shapiro with the Orangutan Republic Foundation. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Tom, for having me. Great to have you here. I think it'll be helpful for our listeners to just hear a bit about your story, your background, your research, and uh, how it is you came to be one of the world's experts in uh, the orangutans. Well, it didn't start out that way. Actually, when I was in high school, I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. And when I was 16, I got certified as a scuba diver. And so it's now been well over 50 years since I've been starting my dive career. And um, went to Sierra College outside of Sacramento in Rockland, California. And it was there that I really found this this kind of passion for... um, interfacing and, and interacting with the natural world. I mean, when you get on get a scuba diving um, you know, suit on and you're in the water, you are surrounded by nature. And um, it's, it's an experience that helped me to really grasp what it meant to be in the real natural world. And I wanted to go off to Humboldt State College to complete my degree in marine biology, but As fate would have it, uh, I was late in applying, and I went off to Fresno State College at the time and found myself completing a degree in um, biology or zoology. And it was at that time I also had a chance to pursue my master's degree. And this was during um, the Vietnam War, you know, and I wanted to stay in college and (laughs) maintain my student deferment. So I stayed in school, and and as fate would have it, as soon as the war ended, my deferment ended. I continued to stay in school, though, as a a graduate student and um, was working in the behavioral area um, in the Department of Zoology. So I found myself obtaining the opportunity to go into the zoo, the Fresno City Zoo, and work with this orangutan. And I was for the longest time trying to figure out what I would want to do. Um, and I had recalled years before meeting Jane Goodall and uh, R. Allen and Beatrice Gardner. They were the couple out of the University of Reno who had taught sign language to the chimpanzee Washo. And I recalled that meeting and I was saying to myself, my gosh, nobody's ever tried teaching a communication system to an orangutan before. So as a young graduate student, I got the opportunity to get into a cage with a Sumatran juvenile orangutan named Azak. And for two years, I was teaching her the the principles of linguistics uh, using plastic children's letters to spell out words. So one symbol was one word. And through association and through conditioning, she was able to understand that a a, a red E meant meant orange and like a, a blue N meant banana. They were all arbitrary, Mm -hmm. but the association allowed us to actually start a conversation. And um, so that that's how I got my chops for orangutans was working with with Azak at the zoo. And just out of curiosity, in that two year period when you were in the cage together, Mm -hmm. you were teaching Azak Mm -hmm. communication. What was Azak teaching you? Oh, uh, well, she was she was showing me how cheeky orangutans can be. <laughs> uh, I was humbled many times by her. She once escaped when I was when I left. Um, and I also learned that orangutans are very much like like us. They have the same kind of depth of emotions that we have. Hmm. Um, they they also do not like being in cages. Uh, one one time, uh, I was there, I, I spent a good time with her, like about an hour or so, and then I left. And I decided just to watch her from the outside because the, the zoo had opened and, and a lot of the visitors started coming in. I was supposed to get out by that time. And you know, I came in early, work with her, then get out. So I was watching uh, Azak with the others and she looked at me and she went right back into the night house and she would not come out until I left. <laughs> 
<laughs> she was resentful that I had left her. Yeah. And that, that, and that you could leave. And I could leave and she couldn't. Yeah. And it was there I started to realize that great apes are very, very sensitive. Um, they understand fairness. And it was not fair that I could come and go, but she could not. Right. Other insights, other things you learned in that, particularly in that two-year period that resulted in you spending the next four decades with orangutans? Well, yeah, again, um, apart from the scientific you know, aspects of her ability to learn, um, I found that being with her um, produced, uh, uh, you know, a change in me in, in that my attitude towards great apes. Um, I had gone off and had met also Coco, the gorilla, who had first learned sign language with Penny Patterson, and I had seen other great apes. So with, with Azak and, and with uh, Keithley, another orangutan in the cage that was released or was put in the cage at the same time, uh, I, I was able to see how they interacted with each other mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, the social skills they, they demonstrated as youngsters. Now, keep in mind, they didn't have a mother at that time. They were pulled from their biological mothers and put into the situation. And so when I would go into the cage, of course, I became the subject of play for them. And it was interesting how, how often they would rather play with me than sit down and be good students. <laughs> Maybe not that surprising, right? That's what kids like to do. They like to play, and they, they actually learn quite a bit in the play situation. So one of the things that I've learned over the years is that we as scientists have to sometimes not think so much about the science, but about the, uh, the fact that we're both sensitive and uh, sentient uh, apes. We, you know, we are apes ourselves. You know, we're on the same connected biological space as they are. And... Um, we're part of a community of equals. And I think that it's important that we as humans recognize that we're driving these animals to extinction. I, I really got to appreciate that more years later when I went to the jungles of Borneo. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raised that because that was a question I was going to ask you. When we think about the, the primate family, mm -hmm. and in particular the humans, mm -hmm. and how we've divorced ourselves or separated ourselves from nature, even though we, we have with our consciousness a responsibility for being stewards of all sentient beings and of nature, we have this sense that we're separate from and apart from nature. And I'd, I'd love for the benefit of our listeners, if you could just talk about the family tree of primates and where humans fit with chimpanzees and great apes and other other species, that would be terrific. Sure, well, very briefly, we are primates. And, and of course, the, the primate family, we go, it probably goes back well over 40 million years, um, the beginning of, of mammals, too. I mean, a very, very long-lived family of, of uh, a group of animals, the primates. So we, we can look at the prosimians, which are like the, um, the lemurs and the, uh, the tarsiers, um, they're, they have very large eyes, and many of them are nocturnal. Mm. And um, they are considered the most primitive of the primates, although I don't like the word primitive because they are successful, the ones that are still alive. They're just as evolved as we are. Um, but then, of course, you have uh, the, the monkeys, uh, the next one. We have old world and new world monkeys. And the new world monkeys would be the ones uh, from South America, Central America, and parts of Mexico. So those would be the uh, spider monkeys, howler monkeys, the ones that have prehensile tails. So they can actually use their tail as a second hand, or as, a, as a third hand, to grab onto branches and whatnot. The old world monkeys, which are the, um, the group from Africa that spread through Southeast Asia and are uh, represented by, say, African monkeys like baboons, and, um, you know, they have... Uh, the colobus monkeys, and there's literally dozens and dozens of these old world monkeys in Africa. And um, we have also the rhesus macaques, the macaques, you've heard of them. Mm -hmm. They're used in, in research quite a bit. Um, and then, of course, we have the apes, which would be represented by uh, the gibbons and siamangs, and they sometimes call them lesser apes. We like to call them smaller apes. You know, it's, it's always good to kind of <laughs> keep it in perspective, yes. right? And, of course, the great apes. Nobody minds what's calling the great apes the great <laughs> apes, right? Because they are very, 
very large, and, and uh, I, th I think they're great. Um, and that would be, of course, the orangutan, the most, uh, the first one that branched off the common ancestor about 12 to 14 million years. Some people push it back even further. Hmm. Um, and then there was a period where the, the African stock gave rise to uh, a group that branched off and you had um, the, of course, the gorillas branching off and then later on the uh, uh, the humans and, and uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, that group as well. It's unclear who came off first um, based on a lot of the data. If you look at the molecular data versus the, uh, the, uh, the bone data, the fossils, uh, you, can, you can kind of play with that a bit. But the truth is, is that we are 99% related to chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, about 98% with gorillas, and about 97% the same as orangutans. Mm. And the thing people have to realize is that it's we share more in common than we do different. And I think and this is one of the reasons why uh, we are sibling species. We're all in the same, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood of the apes. Thanks for sharing that. It's it's helpful background, particularly in the context of our, our conversation today. Sure. And I want to make sure the audience understood where where we fit mm -hmm. in the the tree of life, and, and particularly in the in the primate uh, family. Mm -hmm. So when when I think about the the stereotypes and the the public image that we have of the the various branches within the primate families, um, you've you've shared with us from a DNA perspective where we're, we are humans in relation to others, but when I think about the characteristics of each of the the species in terms of the, the, the various spectrums of violence and nonviolence. Um, you've shared with me before that the orangutans are, are a, a nonviolent species. And when I think about conscious leadership and what it means to be human, we have this story. Mm -hmm. And some of it's a misinterpretation of Darwin's work that we're a violent species. And mm -hmm. the reality is we as human beings are a nonviolent species akin to the orangutan. I'd love to get your perspective on that. Well, I'm not sure I completely agree with you on that, Tom. And it's not because uh, I would, you know, it's not that I wouldn't want us to be that way. But in many ways, um, we, we share parts of what orangutans possess that uh, perhaps are part of our best nature. Hmm. Uh, and yet the genes uh, tell the true story about our relationship. We're more like chimpanzees in many ways. And as we maybe consciously evolve, we, we start to relate more to the orangutan. Maybe that's what you're trying to say. <laughs> but I mean, uh, orangutans, um, there, there has been, of course, um, conflict, mm -hmm. violence amongst at least the males, male-male competition. And if that wasn't so, you wouldn't find that the males were twice the size of the females. I mean, that is a dead giveaway. <laughs> Any of the species you see where the males are twice the size, there's tremendous male-male competition for access to the females. And so we see that with, with gorillas, even though they're gentle giants, they don't normally do this, but in their past, there must have been some tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly the females think the bigger men, and, or the males, are sexier. And so there's, there's female choice that helps to drive this as well. So it's not just the male-males fighting, it's the females making the selection looking for the sexiest you know, males available. <laughs> that has uh, snowballed over evolutionary time to create the kind of uh, you know, a sexual dimorphism we see in, in the primates, especially the great apes and, of course, humans. And um, we know that the male-female ratio with, with human beings isn't as, as great as it is with, with gorillas and orangutans. It's more like chimpanzees. Mm. And so we also know that chimpanzees do commit warfare, and they go out and they will, will murder others. So in some sense, we do share a lot of our violent tendencies with the chimpanzees. And we also share a lot of the politics that we have. And there's been some books written, like by Franz de Waal, about chimpanzee politics. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I think that our better nature, perhaps, as we, as we start to evolve, you know, the stoic nature of the orangutan, very quiet, very contemplative, uh, we, we may, it's more of a kind of a, they call it synamorphy. It's, it's, it's a, t it's a characteristic which, which we, uh, may have in common that has been derived through convergence 
rather than, say, divergence, say, in evolution. So I'd like to pick up on the conversation from before. You, you spent a couple of years um, in the cage. Mm-hmm. And you, you, from that experience, you've spent the last four decades in Indonesia with the orangutans. And I'd, I'd love to hear what you've ob- observed, why you've stayed at it, what, uh, what you could share with our audience. I'd love to. I mean, I think the story is um, one of transformation for me. Um, and, you know, I would love to say that I go back and, and hang out with orangutans every year, but I don't. Um, the first two years, from 78 to 80, and then later going back to do some tests and whatnot, I was very close with the orangutans. In fact, one um, orangutan named Princess um, adopted me as her, as her father. And, I mean, I, I wanted to do a study where I could look at the sign learning development of an orangutan and compare the orangutan to the other great apes that had learned before, like Washo, mm-hmm. as I mentioned before, yep. and Coco. Uh, and I, want, I knew I had to start with a young, young orangutan. And so um, I was very fortunate. There were d- dozens of orangutans out there. We lived in cages for the most part, and the orangutans were free ranging. These were ex-captives. Yep. Many of them were much older, who are now just you know wandering around camp, trying to figure out how to get into the houses and into the dining hall and places where we <laughs> stored the bananas. They were trying to break in, and we were locking ourselves up at night to protect ourselves from, you know, from not so much orangutans, but from the other wildlife that's out there, you know, the pythons, the snakes, and everything else that could come in. Um, so, yeah, I was there with Princess. Um, uh, I went into a holding cage where we kept the, the youngsters at night to keep them away from the bush pigs and other predators. And um, she, she essentially selected me. She jumped into my arms. And so part of what you do when you teach science to, to an orangutan or any great ape is you have to have a relationship. You mm-hmm. have to have kind of this close connection. And, and so uh, I, I, I couldn't think of a better way than to have the ape choose me rather than me just going and grabbing one at random. Yeah. And um, so for almost two years, we, li- we lived together. Uh, at Camp Leakey in the jungles of Borneo. It's something that today would be very difficult to do just because of how things have changed and um, uh, our view of how we should treat these great apes and health and safety issues. But at the time, nobody had done this before. So it was a pioneering effort to at least show that orangutans were as capable as the other great apes to learn how to sign. And I didn't want to get into the controversy of is this language or is it not language? <laughs> I knew that I had to graduate, and I didn't want to do a study that would put me, you know, in school for decades trying to prove to my committee that this was linguistic or not, because it's a, it's a very controversial subject. Mm. You know, we still like to think that we're the only ones who use language. Right. And um, so what I was focusing on was sign learning. And in fact, Princess was one of four orangutans that I, that I looked at and I taught signs in a very um, scientific manner using statistics and things <laughs> like that, you know? And it was really to kind of tease out the factors that influence sign learning and that became my dissertation. But at the same time, I was home rearing princess because I also wanted a body of data to kind of see how far she could go with learning and using signs. Yep. And, and so that was really the thing that changed my life, uh, becoming a father to an orangutan, another species. And, and to me, that was, um, I, I started to relate to becoming and uh, almost channeling orangutans in my own being. Uh, I found myself acting like orangutans too, where I would just kind of stare off into the trees and wonder, why am I doing this? <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, this is, this is a fruit stare. I'm looking for fruit. This is what orangutans do. <laughs> and so it was, it was really kind of a, a, like a transformative experience to actually find myself identifying with orangutans, but doing so on my terms. So I wasn't a child who was raised with the orangutans. I was, right. a, I was an adult who came out there who started to relate to princess and the other great apes. And I saw them just as individuals, not as 
orangutans. Right, right. You know, they were there was Princess and there's Sisoyo and there's Rambe and you know there's Rini and I got to know them as persons. And in fact, their name orangutan means person of the forest. Right. So that that was one of the most I think uh, transformative things for me, and why I've dedicated my life to trying to save them because they are critically endangered now in all populations. You're watching the Impact Effect Network. Who you are is how you lead. Conscious leadership is an intuitive, intentional process requiring an open heart, an open mind, and a committed desire to fully own how you show up in the world. If you're a CEO, a solopreneur, or a community leader, Tom Eddington's ebook helps you amplify your strengths, making you the best version of yourself. Download the ebook today and become a part of bringing conscious leadership to the planet. I'd love to just hear a bit more about what you learned about yourself and what you learned about the human species um, in your time with them. I got to tell you, the, the time out there, um, if you were in the middle of the jungle and sometimes without any kind of social ability to talk to people and because you're learning a new language and you just don't have the ability to, to converse, um, you learn about what you're made out of, uh, what you're capable of doing. Um, and certainly there were points, like, and I, I noticed every six months I'd go through this kind of a breakdown. Uh, I mean, a real psychological breakdown mm. where I'd cry, I'd go off to the river, and, and then I'd just be able to pick myself back up and continue on. And, and I kept a diary so I, I could track all of this. And it was probably the most important bit of data that I collected was, was writing a daily diary. And I haven't done that since, but I mean, <laughs> those two years was priceless and now I'm using it to actually help with, with the books I'm writing mm. uh, about my experience out there because we, we have a tendency to forget those little things that happen during the day. Or right? at least misremember. Or misremember, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, uh, I think just being out there, learning about um, how to solve problems in an area where um, you know you don't have all the tools that you need. And then also, I, was, I had to become the leader of, from time to time. I was the <clears> vice <throat> director of Camp Leakey. And having to uh, intervene in uh, intercultural disputes, that was really something. That, that really put my, uh, you know, my skills to the test, so my interpersonal skills. And uh, thankfully, I made it through that. I kept my head because <laughs> I was living, I was actually working with the, the Dayak people, the indigenous people of Borneo, who have a, a very, they're a very, very special people, very, I mean, the first world people of, of, of Borneo. And um, just as in, in the West here, we use guns to, you know, solve problems, and it's part of our history. They use the headhunting knife <laughs> to solve problems. <laughs> and, you know, there were times where, uh, not so much the Dayaks, but um, some of the others who I had to deal with were, were not happy with me. So I had to understand that. What was the dynamic behind it, and how could I kind of lower hmm. the energy to make sure we were able to get through uh, a, a, you know, a challenge. So it was, it was, a, it was a, a, an amazing time. I mean, having to go out and shop every couple of weeks, go to town and do that. I'd have to leave Princess behind. I'd come back and she was sometimes moody with me, you know. And, um, you know, I found that learning Indonesian was actually much faster because of the signing I was doing with the, the orangutans. It might have tapped into something that allowed me to learn much faster because mm -hmm. I became fluent within six months and found the experience much more enjoyable, especially when I went to town and had to do things, uh, interact with the local people. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I highly recommend leaving the comfort zone of where you <laughs> grew up and go to a place that is so different and uh, figure out who you really are. Well, that's uh, when when I use the term conscious leadership. That's that's one of the fundamental pieces is self awareness mm -hmm. um, to being a conscious leader. It's knowing who you are and and how you're being in the world and how people are experiencing you. Exactly. And <clears throat> having lived outside the U.S., uh, where the country I was born, um, I've I've had those opportunities to question my beliefs, question my assumptions, because they don't work in other cultures. And I suspect that that's part of what you were talking about. Absolutely. Is, um, developing that sense of self-awareness, that sense of who am I 
and what do I believe and how am I showing up and how are others in a different culture and cultural context experiencing me. Exactly, exactly. And it was also there that I saw firsthand what was happening to the environment, um, why the forests were being raised. Uh, at the time, it was illegal logging. And the orangutans were coming to us as a consequence of that, mm -hmm. the illegal pet trade. <clears throat> so um, it was very, very clear at the time something had to be done. Um, I was out there with, with the others. That and this is the uh, 1980s we're talking about? 1978 to 1980, and then continuing on. Mm -hmm. um, the area had not become a national park yet, but we were working on um, doing surveys and expeditions to show the government that the area was, was, was filled with biodiversity and areas that were very sensitive, like Bird Lake, uh, or this kind of fabled lake in the middle of the peninsula that nobody had ever documented before until we went out there and saw the dozens of, or like five major waterfowl that used it as a, as a nesting area. And we were able to find it because we hired the poachers from town to take <laughs> us out there. <laughs> You know, you got to you got to figure out who knows how to get there. Right. But in doing that, we were able to um, and with reports from WWF and others who were out there at the time, eventually uh, the government uh, declared it a national park, mm. giving it a higher status. Right. So the the area, despite having the status, was still under threat, making it um, protected on paper doesn't guarantee that it's protected right. from those who would break the law or yeah. who felt that this was theirs to use as well. And frequently, um, government has a tendency to not do the socialization properly with the local people. This is something that I also learned and which I've applied to my own foundation in um, being as effective as we are in places like Sumatra, where we're working to help save the Sumatran orangutan. Um, by working with local people. Hmm. So one of the things that I realized at the time was that we needed to create an organization that would address the orangutan. There was no group at the time. So in, in 1985, uh, we started the Orangutan Foundation International. I was the vice president with the woman who people know uh, as the Jane Goodall of orangutans. Uh, her name is Barute Galdikas, but she, she and I ran this organization. Uh, I ran it with her for 18 years and realized that, you know, rehabilitating ex-captives uh, was not enough. We really needed to address the, uh, the causal factors, which are things like ignorance, uh, fear, um, and poverty, hmm. things of, of that sort. And uh, not enough was being done by our organization at the time, uh, or other groups. So my wife, my Indonesian wife and I, uh, we co-founded the Orangutan Republic Foundation in 2004. Uh, actually, it started out as the Orangutan Republic Education Initiative. It was a project under a, an umbrella 501c3 because we wanted to hit the ground running. We had no time, and so we were using the, uh, the legal mechanism that they were able to provide to allow us to um, enact our program, which we had sketched out. And to my amazement, all this unfolded within a couple of years <laughs> as I had planned. And it was almost with very little effort because the timing was right. And I got the, I was able to enroll uh, members of government of Indonesia to serve as our kind of focal point. And for a number of years, the office of our organization in Jakarta was the penthouse of the parliament building <laughs> in Jakarta. And so with that, and in, in getting the, the Minister of Forestry to declare Orangutan Caring Week, and we were creating Orangutan Caring Clubs, all this was unfolding within a, just a several years. It was like amazing. And I think that is one of the things you realize with conscious leadership, yes. is that if, if, you, if you know how to do that, if you don't, if it's not about you personally, but it's about the mission and the people gravitate towards the cause, it will unfold, and sometimes very quickly. Yeah. So we were able to start a project in, in Sumatra, and we created the Orangutan Caring Clubs, and one of them has now become a foundation, a full-fledged foundation in Sumatra, 
and we've been supporting them as they work uh, along the border of the Gunung Lusser National Park, where there has been problems with human-wildlife conflict. So for us, it's very important to understand the local people need to make a living themselves. Mm. And we kind of look down our noses and think, well, that's, that's just another corrupt country. But the reality is people, uh, they do want to do, do well. They want to at least feed their family and send their kids to school. So one of the things that our group started along with another indigenous uh, organization in Sumatra was the Orangutan Caring Scholarships, providing scholarships for those students in the provinces where wild orangutans are still found and focusing in the areas of biology, forestry, and, and uh, veterinary science, those kinds of areas where it would benefit orangutans. And it's had a rippling effect throughout the community because you not give not only a, a scholarship to a student, but you're giving it to a family, and it's going to spread out to the community. So we feel very, very proud. We've given out now 172 multi-year scholarships. I, I administer this. I am seeking support from a broad group of, of organizations and people who also feel this is a good investment. It's the only scholarship in the name of an animal that I know of, <laughs> the Orangutan Caring Scholarship. And my hope is that uh, next year or the year after, we'll be able to complete the constellation of provinces. Because so we started in Sumatra, yep. North Sumatra, went up to Aceh, you know, where the tsunami yes. was yep. back in 04. We went across to West Borneo. Last year, we started in central Borneo, where I got my start. And I'm hoping to get to East Borneo, where uh, another large population of orangutans still live. And the idea is, of course, these students will stay in their home area mm. and become advocates for orangutans and go into government, go into business, go into education, nonprofits too, and and serve as the as the teachers for another generation. I think that's really, really important. You're watching the Impact Effect Network, the world's first 24-hour on-demand business and leadership video and podcast network, bringing conscious leadership to a global audience. Well, as, as I listen to what you've shared, um, you know, one, one of the things I'm noticing that you have done is you've taken a systems approach in, in the way you've, you've tried to address this problem and, um, and the work that you do. And that's certainly a requirement of being a conscious leader is to, to think systemically. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you, a skill set you acquired through your academic training? Is it something you learned from the orangutan? Is it something that you innately just came into this world with? Where does that systems view and systems thinking come from, from Mother Nature? Well, it's, it's a great question, and I think I was blessed to have been able to have done this now over these years, over this 40-year this period almost, uh, because um, I had a 27-year career in state government. And... I was involved in uh, doing um, uh, hazardous waste cleanup and uh, uh, drug lab cleanup, the Breaking Bad thing, you right. know, many, many years ago, <laughs> and um, became very involved because I worked for the emergency response uh, division. Uh, I had to learn about systems because when you respond to emergencies, you have to operate within a system. Correct. In fact, California <clears throat> developed what's called the incident command system very beautiful system which which umbrellas that and how it it operates it, it it scopes out as the incident becomes larger and larger and I always thought that what we're doing in Borneo and in Sumatra dealing with this crisis is like an emergency mm. and so my mind almost <clears throat> like automatically and I and my, my supervisors were always always supportive of my desire to go overseas and spend my my time off there and it's one of the reasons why I never rose up in the ranks beyond being a, <laughs> excuse me, bless you. <coughs> I never rose up in the ranks besides being a line worker. Because if I did that, I would not be able to amass overtime and I couldn't have spent the time going overseas. So I said, you know what? I'm not interested in becoming a manager in government. I'm the president of an organization. I This is giving me my, my passion and I was able to pay the bills through my government work. And it was very interesting work. I mean, and, but I realized that as soon as I could retire and collect my Social Security and put together a package that was parody, I needed to get out and focus on the orangutan, on my passion. 
So that's how I brought in the systems. That's how I've been able to kind of keep this thing going. And um, I'm just fortunate that the people that I've worked with believe in this mission as well. So how did, how did you walk that path of needing to be a leader in the organization you and your wife founded while being in a managerial role in your day job? Yeah, well, I did the, uh, the foundation work after hours and mm -hmm. on weekends. So I didn't have to um, have the conflict. And I also you know, made sure there wasn't a conflict of interest. In fact, the works that we did, and sometimes I would take uh, individuals, some of the employees, on, on trips to Borneo. I took my supervisor out and his <laughs> wife to visit Princess. And in fact, it was the last time I saw her in mm -hmm. 2011. Um, they published uh, our trips in their newsletter. And so there wasn't a problem with me doing this on the side. Um, and, you know, it's, I think it's really important. Um, people would come to me and they said, gee, I'd like to do this. I've got a passion too. And I would try to show them ways that they could take their passion, even though they are working in state government, and maybe do what I did and work under an umbrella for a while until you built your, your, your capacity to spin off as your own nonprofit. Right. I want to drill into this a bit more because the, the competencies that someone needs to be an effective manager and the competencies one needs to be an effective leader are different. Yes, they are. And so how did you build those competencies to be an effective leader of your organization? And where, where did that come from? Was it trial and error? Was it through reading? Was it through um, experience, learning from others, mentors? How, how, did you, how did you make that transition? I think, uh, frankly, Tom, I think everybody starts out as a leader. <laughs> I think it's something, you know, we are the leader of, of trillions of cells in our mm -hmm. body. And it's our job to keep those cells healthy and happy, right? And so, it, you know, we normally talk about leadership as um, leading uh, a, a team of people to, to solve a problem or to reach a goal, something of that sort, right? Um, and do so with using um, social influence mm -hmm. of some sort, correct? And so... I think as children, we do this. We do this in the playground. We do it, you know, I, I learned those skills too. Uh, I wasn't always the most, um, I guess, uh, stand, stand out type when it came to being a leader. I was more of a kind of a, you know, guy who liked to read books and was reading, you know, Jules Verne. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be a diver, I, I, I related to Captain Nemo, who was not <laughs> the kind of classic <laughs> leader. You know, he was more like the anti-leader or the anti-hero, right? right. But, but, you know, he was also a disruptor hmm. and something, you know, the kind of people we kind of look up to today. Somebody wants to get into a new area and change it dramatically. Yes. So um, and I took I took leadership classes uh, when I was in government. They would encourage you to get training. I think training is so important. And I took personal development classes as well. So um, all that, I think, collectively helped me to become the leader that I am with, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Well, thank you for sharing that, because I, I, I agree with you that each of us innately have those skills we come into the world with, and increasingly the, the complexity of the systems problems that we have in our, yeah. in our culture, in our world today, everyone's being called to be a leader. And so I just was curious to understand how you develop those skill sets, given your quote-unquote day job wasn't enabling you to necessarily build those skills in your, in your daily work. I always felt when I went to work that I was the leader of myself <laughs> and I was responsible to get the job done yes. you know, whatever. and whatever. I always felt uh, proud to serve the people of California. And, you know, I noticed people around me sometimes that weren't necessarily stellar employees. But it's up to them yeah. to find their own route. I wouldn't want to criticize anybody. You know, I can only control myself. Right. And so that to me, I, and I, you know, I looked forward to coming to work even though I realized that it wasn't my primary passion. You know, I enjoyed the, the diversity of work. Mm -hmm. Drug labs can be very interesting. And, you know, if I had to learn how to get into the moon suit. I had to learn, learn how to make methamphetamine, <laughs> you know, as part of what we had to identify in the field when we did cleanups. Right. All of this was, you know, as a chemist type, I enjoyed the kind of mental rigor it gave me. But um, 
And I was leading the, the group there as well as far as uh, managing our contractors. I had to do oversight and all of that. So I always saw myself, even though I wasn't a leader, I was a line guy. I saw myself as a leader yes. doing what I was doing. And, and maybe it was just wishful thinking on my part. Maybe it's, but I think that um, we all have to realize that we can create um, the happiness we have, we can create the attitudes we have that we carry through this world, and we don't have to wait for permission from somebody else. Well, those, those are essential pieces, and certainly in the work I do in the teaching and the, the writing and <clears throat> the speaking that I do around conscious leadership is that we are absolutely leaders of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when I think about the three-stage model of, of managing one's career, the first stage is what do you know? Mm -hmm. And it's all about that knowledge acquisition. The second stage is what do you do, meaning what results do you achieve? And the, and the third stage is around how are you being? How are others experiencing you? We're human beings, not human doings. So how do you be? How do you show up in the world? And someone who's an effective leader, particularly a conscious leader, is keenly aware of how am I being? How are others experiencing me? Yes. And that's the first lesson of leadership is taking full responsibility and accountability for how I'm being in the world. I have to tell you that <clears throat> it's, it's, it's been a challenge to me uh, over the years to to balance uh, the professional side and the relationship side, which I think most everybody can identify with. When you really want to be the top in your field, something is going to give if you, and if you don't address that in the right way, it's like rebalancing your portfolio, right? You've got to put some time and energy into the relationships that yes. are the most important, really. Apart from yourself, which is number one, you mm -hmm. got to take care of your health. You know, it's like put your mask on before you help somebody else in the airplane. Well, you got to make sure that you're in good shape, you're healthy. But then I realized that it's the relationships are the second most important thing. And I didn't do that for many, many years and almost lost my wife on a couple of occasions. But finally, when you realize and you, you know, you put your ego in the right perspective and you recognize that you have to make adjustments and you make those adjustments, and you can find that, that kind of balance that allows you to, you know, hopefully do your passion without sacrificing your relationships. That's been like one of the biggest things I've, I've learned. Hmm. And it's one that um, I tell volunteers this too, because working with volunteers, Tom, is like so important. It's always kept me felt energized. I feel much younger than my age would, would perhaps suggest, but, um, I tell them, I said, look, you're giving your free time to help out in this cause, and I'm, I'm so happy you're doing that. But don't give so much that you sacrifice the relationships in your life. Yep. Because sometimes people go into it full bore, and they don't realize that their they're, they're, they're other person in the family, their, their significant other, may be hurting and just hasn't addressed it. And it can lead to a point where a breakup could take place. And so I, I, I advise them, you know, Thank you for your time. Let's figure out what you can do that's not going to overtax your relationships yeah. and things like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm painfully aware of it from personal experience. I don't want to uh, ask anybody to help out that, that can't afford the time. You're watching the Impact Effect Network. Is your team tuned out? Are you looking for a powerful speaker to motivate and inspire your organization? then Tom Eddington is the choice for keynote speaker at your next conference or event. Tom is one of the most sought after business advisors and coaches in Silicon Valley. For over two decades, Tom has advised world-renowned CEOs and executives on how to catapult their organization's success, including Hewlett Packard, NBNA Corporation, and Royal Dutch Shell. In his dynamic keynotes, Tom offers fresh new paradigms on how to create healthier, happier, and more purposeful workplaces while navigating change and generating higher degrees of success for organizations. For information on booking Tom at your next event, contact EddingtonAdvisory.com. So with working with volunteers, something I encourage the, the clients I work with to recognize is that anybody who's working for them is a volunteer. And they should have that same mentality, that same mindset, mm -hmm. that while they're getting a paycheck, first and foremost, you need to think of them as a volunteer, <laughs> that yeah. they can volunteer someplace else. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so to have that same attitude, that same mindset of you're coming to work here, but you could volunteer anywhere. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I think that um, the value that you, you get in volunteers can't be overstated. And, and showing them your appreciation is one of the most important things as a leader can do because it's too easy for a, a volunteer to feel unappreciated for right. what they do. Yeah. So it's something that I've learned as well. And you know, we try to acknowledge the volunteers, um, provide them with, you know, uh, not just a pat on the back, but you know, give them something special. And um, you know, it's, it's part of just nurturing and developing an organization, I think. Yeah. And, and with volunteers, they're showing up because they're passionate or they're showing up because they want to acquire some new skills and employees are showing up for the same reason. Yes, they, there's a paycheck involved as well, but they're there because hopefully they're, you've created an environment where they're passionate. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're showing up because they're looking to acquire new skills and to grow and learn and be engaged. That's what you hope. Yes. And I know that um, when we started the Orangutan Caring Club in, in Sumatra, they were all volunteers. They were coming together just to meet and to create programs and I was so inspired because they were doing things that I'd never thought about doing. Like going to the mosques and speaking to the imams and having them deliver the sermon <laughs> about environment right. and orangutans <laughs> on Friday night. I was going, wow, what a great idea, <laughs> you know? And, and they were meeting and they were helping uh, new couples plant trees as a tree planting uh, operation to you know, integrate that into the culture. I thought that was brilliant, yep. right? And then eventually I was able to uh, find the funds to give them um, a paycheck, or an they call it an incentive because yep. it's not that much, but it allows them now to focus their time, full time, on the work. And that was a major game changer for us and it's something that I still feel very, very strongly because we want them to um, raise a family and be able to uh, do things they need to do uh, and treat this as a as a job but with that volunteer spirit yeah well what, what I love about that that story and what you just shared is that it's another attribute of what I consider to be a conscious leader is you weren't trying to control it mm -hmm. you weren't trying to centralize it you were allowing folks to come up with these ideas to implement them to pilot them and to to run with them yeah Exactly. And I learned, the, the, learned that the hard way, too, when I wanted to put on a conference. And it was, a, it was an idea that was co kind of created with another colleague of mine working out in, in Sumatra. You know, we wa nobody had yet addressed the issue of killing, the killings of orangutans. We wanted to create a, a conference figuring out how do we stop this? What kind of curriculum could we develop? But I found that I was pushing against... <laughs> a force and but I felt so strongly about it uh, I kept pushing and pushing and I realized that my gosh this is so hard to do when you're going against the, what many of the people wanted and the only thing that working for me was the money that I was bringing in from yeah. the US government a US Fish and Wildlife grant yeah. that was behind <clears throat> me we, we, we got it done but I realized after that if we don't get the people saying we want this then I've decided not to push my agenda. Mm. Wait for them to say, Gary, if you'd like to help us with that, please, we would appreciate your help. That's more powerful than, than coming in saying, this is what you guys need. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a bit about the, the state of the, the ecosystem where the orangutans are. Yeah. Um, what is the, um, you know, pulling out your crystal ball, what's the the likelihood that the species are, are going to survive, um, what's needed, mm -hmm. and what, what can people do to help? It's a great, great set of questions because it's one of the hardest things to do is to figure out, number one, how many orangutans are left. We do know that regardless as, as the, as of the number, the forces that are affecting their future are in play and they are not helping at all because um, the destruction of their habitat continues to go on, um, both, you know, sanctioned, not necessarily always by the federal side, mm -hmm. but more often by the local governments 
who feel uh, that they're far away enough from Jakarta and they can do things that um, Jakarta's not going to watch and people aren't going to watch. So there's something called it's illegal but official. <laughs> and, and so permits for clearing forest to create um, plantations, small plantations, sometimes larger ones, that's still going on to some degree. Um, we, th we think that in an over 16-year period from like uh, 2000, uh, 1999 to 2015, maybe over 100,000 orangutans were killed because of this operation of opening up the forest for estate plantations, primarily for palm oil. And people have been vilifying palm oil over the last number of years. Um, I'm not one who feels that we should completely vilify a product that's used in so many different things. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most productive uh, oils that we can create uh, agriculturally. And one that employs millions and millions of people. Uh, to say we should boycott it, I think, is, is not correct. But I think that we should do things that encourage sustainable uh, agriculture, whether it's palm oil or any other mm -hmm. product that becomes popular. Because, you know, we know that whatever somebody comes up with that is going to um, make money, people are going to want to replicate it and scale yeah. it up. Yeah. And in a country like Indonesia, where... Uh, you may not have the kind of regulations that you'd like. Scaling up can sometimes prove to be a problem. So I think we have to look at this in a more systematic way. Um, I think also one of the things that are hopeful for us is this idea that we can perhaps purchase or lease large tracts of forest for future generations and manage them um, as, as a company. Mm -hmm. And and so we, we've already done this. Uh, my my uh, sister gr group, TOP, the, the Orangutan Project out of Australia, um, which we provide uh, fiscal support in mm -hmm. this country, they have been operating in uh, central, south central um, Sumatra in a place, a uh, province called Jambi, um, a location called Bukit Tigapulu, which means 30 hills. And it's a both a national park and it's also an ecosystem restoration concession. It's being managed by a number of uh, organizations. And, and the idea is that we can now hire people to protect it. We can ensure the viability of this area, even though it may be like an island mm -hmm. surrounded by plantations, both pulp and paper and palm oil. But we can set this aside for future generations and manage it over decades and decades. I think that is one of the, the shining lights that we have, is if we can continue to identify areas and find the funds to purchase or to lease it over a period of generations, we will be able to mitigate the loss of other wildlife, not just orangutans, but other wildlife that share this habitat. And I think that we have a, we have a chance to save the species. Now, there's three species, by the way. People may not know this. Uh, they used to only have one and two subspecies, the Bornean and the Sumatran, but a number of years ago, they decided, because of the genetics data, to speciate the Bornean and the Sumatran. And then, like two years ago, we discovered there's a small southernmost population in Sumatra. These are orangutans with somewhat frizzy hair, and they live in a place called Tapanuli. And so Pongo tapanuliensis, the Tapanuli orangutan, was, was uh, described. Um, even though they knew it was there for many years, they just described it and it now became a brand new species, mm. the most recent species. So there's 800 of these orangutans left, the most critically endangered of all orangutans. And so what we need to do is maintain monitoring these populations. We need to continue to support the indigenous people there who have come up. And this is what we're doing. It's not just Westerners doing this now. One of the things I feel strongly about, and many others do, is we need to get the Indonesian conservationists and conservation educators standing up and driving the process themselves. And I'm so proud to be able to meet a number of them who have uh, got, obtained awards, uh, international awards for what they're doing. And we need to showcase these, these young people and to provide them with the resources they need to keep doing the good work. So what are some other things that uh, that need to be done and that our listeners might be able to help support? Well, I think that just supporting organizations like um, the Orangutan Project and the Orangutan Republic Foundation and many, many others that are out there 
is, is really important. I think people should see this as an investment in the future. Um, keeping in mind that it's not just orangutans we're protecting. It's the, it's the lungs of the earth. Mm. So if you're thinking about you know, climate change, one of the pieces of the puzzle is protecting the forests. So if you're helping organizations that are helping the forest survive or replanting areas that were degraded, I think you're, you're investing in the future for our grandkids. And this is what I would like people to realize is this, we're living in a time of existential threats. Um, globally, we are, we, we're seeing that this is the hottest month on record. Last month was the hottest. I don't think that this, that's a fluke. I think it's gonna be the norm. And you know, at some point, we're gonna be hitting these tipping points. Uh, and one of the ways we can mitigate that is to protect the forests. And I think people should be spending more of their money uh, supporting organizations that are, that are legitimate doing the important work in the field. That's, I think, the hardest thing. The second thing they can do is they can shop smart. So when you're buying products, look at the label. See if it says sustainable palm oil on it. And if it doesn't, if this is a favorite product of yours, ask the manufacturer, is this from a RSPO, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, or some other certifying body that will tell you this is sustainable? If they can't answer, go for something else. You have a lot of power with the way you purchase products. What I'm really happy to see is that California has passed, leg or is moving legislation through, it's now in the Senate, uh, that will require California government to purchase deforestation-free uh, commodities in the supply chain hmm. of California. And we're a big, big um, buyer. Yes. So if we can get that passed, this will also set an example for those businesses that have been reluctant to go into sustainable you know, into that process of, of certifying sustainable and to go there. And I'm, I'm, I think that what I, I, I envision in the future is that orangutans, if we keep at this pace, we will save uh, a number of the, po the critical populations. I know we're going to lose some that are very small. They're what we call metapopulations. Mm -hmm. These are small populations that are isolated. Genetically, they don't have connection because they're little islands. And if you have a, a metapopulation of a couple hundred, 300, the, there is a tendency for natural phenomena to cause the population to rise and fall, rise and fall, and possibly crash. Hunting, fires, things like that could right. actually drive those small populations to extinction. I suspect we're going to lose some of those. But for those groups who are managing large tracts of land with orangutans, we are not going to let that happen. My hope is that we can have a soft landing and maybe actually improve the population size because, in fact, that is the vision of the Orangutan Republic. It's, it's really a vision statement of the future. I want to see robust populations of orangutans living side by side with local people. Yep. And if we respect each other, I think that can happen. Well, what's the, uh, what's the one thing that you'd like our listeners to take away from this conversation today? I'd like the listeners to learn more about the issues that are affecting orangutans. I'd like them to uh, dig deeper than just watching a movie with an orangutan in it. Yeah. I think if they, if they um, recognize that orangutans are, again, uh, sentient creatures, uh, sensitive, intelligent creatures, and I've been working also um, on the effort to give them personhood status, legal personhood status, because like elephants and cetaceans, um, we should not consider them as things for our using. We should consider them as their own beings, just as we would any human being. We should consider them as uh, having basic rights, and the Great Ape Project has defined those. So. I would like people to kind of wrap their mind around that idea, too, to kind of consider that they're more than just this funny-looking animal in a zoo, <laughs> but they are majestic. They, they serve ecological purposes in the forest. They, they um, open up the canopy to allow light to come. They take dead wood. They break it off. They make sure then those young seedlings get light so they can regenerate the forest. They spread seeds through their eating of, of fruits. They're right. the largest fruit-eating animal in the world. 
uh, largest arboreal mammal, and they are doing, uh, they are really uh, ecosystem engineers. If we think of them as performing these functions, whether you think of them as evolved or not, think about them as serving a very important function in the lungs of the earth, especially in Southeast Asia. Right. So people should learn more about this, the magic story. I mean, it's really an inspiring story. And if people want to get more involved, there's all kinds of things they can do. They can go out and visit the orangutans. They can go out to Indonesia and see with their own eyes what's happening. And they can hopefully inspire others to get involved. Well, thanks for being on the show, Gary. It's been a pleasure being with you today. Uh, for folks wanting to learn more about you and your work, uh, where, where do they go to find out? They can go to our website, Orangutan Republic, and that's with a K, dot O-R-G. All one word. Great. Well, thank you, Gary. Thanks, Tom. You're watching the Impact Effect Network. Thank you for joining Tom Eddington on the Impact Effect. Visit impacteffectnetwork.com to connect with Tom and discover additional episodes featuring today's top leaders making a global impact through conscious leadership in the world today.